Hello everybody, E here. Welcome to my first long form video. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm going to be super busy this year and I only have time for a certain number of videos. That's why you haven't heard from me unless you've watched the live streams. That's why you haven't seen a video since December. So today we are going to go through everything that I read for the month of January. Um, I have two uh, review requests to talk about. Those will be up front um, and then I will read all the stuff that I read from my own pleasure and then a bonus round at the end for anything that I was able to fit in before the end of the month. I read a total of seven books equaling 1,944 pages in the month of January. Let's jump in to the reviews. Okay, so first up we have A Black and Endless Sky by Matthew Lyons. This is his follow-up to The Night Will Find Us, his debut novel. It's not a sequel, completely different story, completely different characters, but it's his sophomore effort. Um, luckily, Matthew uh, Lyons does not fall into the sophomore curse that so many authors fall into. I have no idea how many books he's written before he started publishing, um, or how many stories or anything like that. All I know is the guy is damn good. This is a story about Jonah and Nail, Nell, sorry, Nell, N-E-L-L. -L. Uh, it is a bit of road trip horror. The book opens up with a very uh, uh, blockbuster scene of uh, cosmic horror uh, set out in the desert where government, shady government officials are digging a hole down to a secret chamber and of course being the government they decide to blow it open and all hell breaks loose after that. Uh, while on the road they run a, a Jonah and Nell run into a biker gang and the biker gang they get into a fight uh, someone dies and the chase is on. So the rest of the book is um, well something else happens I don't want to go into too many spoilers here but something else happens and Nell develops not powers, maybe you want to call it, uh, and the biker gang is after them, and this book is bloody and brutal, and I was here for it. Uh, the characters are fantastic. Jonah is running from a life of, not, not crime, but he used to be uh, a fighter. He loved to fight. Uh, is a very kick-ass individual, uh, you know, just, just completely annihilates people when he fights them, and he's trying to change, trying to do better. Nell doesn't like that fact. Uh, that's how they get into the trouble that they do at the biker bar, um, by putting him into a situation where he has to defend himself and his sister. Uh, all, all the while, you have the biker gang, you have, uh, I believe, Terry is the leader, and then you also meet another lady, I believe her name was Anna, um, who knows something about what's happening to Nell. Uh, all these characters are fleshed out. They're, they're terrific. That's one of the things that makes uh, Matthew Lyon shine. Uh, he, he does a really fantastic job of making you care or understand uh, these characters and their motivations. Uh, you may not like them. All of them have faults. All of them are very human. Um, and that's what I like in, in characters. Um, that, you know, not necessarily I have to relate to them, but I have to at least be able to understand them. Um, now, uh, that was, that's the characters. The, the dread is, is fantastic because the way Lyons writes, you never know who's going to be safe. I found this out in his first book because I believe I thought that the very first person to die in the last book was going to be a main character or is going to have an important role and they died right up front. Uh, in, in this one, he really puts his characters through the ringer and the dread is off the charts because you, you don't know who's going to survive and you really like these characters. Um, I, I really enjoyed reading about them. Uh, especially Jonah, because he's fighting with his inner demons, so you're hoping that the, the dread is you're hoping that he's going to make it, and hopefully Nell too, hopefully Nell changes and, and gets takes her head out of her ass, that kind of thing. Um, as far as the pacing, this book blows by. Uh, I think I read it in a total of three sittings, but since it was an ARC, I am reading little chunks as I was doing my uh, TBR. Uh, I will explain later on in the video why I'm doing the TBR, why I'm doing a book ban, all these things. Uh, I'll let you guys know, but if you've watched the live streams, you've already heard it. 
Also, if you want to catch the live streams, I'll be doing them sporadically. Uh, just turn on all notifications uh, down there where you know it says set notifications. Just do the live ones unless you want notifications for all of them, then click that one. But this is an easy five stars for me. Uh, many thanks to, uh, let's see, your Turner Publishing for sending me a review copy of this book. Turner is killing it. I have enjoyed everything that they have sent me so far except for one of them, and we are not going to mention that. Um, um, but uh, that's way, 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 way in the past. Um, so with with this one, I highly recommend you give it a pre-order. Um, and I think the testament to me having not liked one of their books and giving this one a five kind of maybe will take the bias out of your mind. I don't know. With, with review copies, you never know how people are going to feel um, about you accepting something for free in return for review. But if you've been paying attention to the channel at, for any length of time, you know no, that's not me. I'm going to tell you exactly how it is. And this one, easy five stars. Next up, we have No Second Chances by Rio Ewers. Uh, I am constantly amazed at how prolific Ewers is and how consistent he is as a writer. He is, his books have always been great. Um, I said in my Goodreads review, by the way, links to each one of the time signatures for these books and their affiliate links where you can buy them and my Goodreads review will all be down there in the doobly-doo. Um, I think I'm going to be missing three by the time this goes live as far as the Goodreads review uh, reviews are concerned, uh, but I will get them added eventually. Um, I'm just, once again, I'm running out of time, but uh, Rio's, Rio, what, Rio Ewers was kind enough to send me an advanced review copy of this book, uh, and like I was saying, from Westlake Soul, I, I, I want to I harp on this. Westlake Soul is a very uh, surreal drama about a man stuck in a bed, um, paralyzed from, I believe, the neck down. Uh, his name is Westlake Soul. Uh, then you have some, Halcyon, which is a story about a cult and horror, and it even has surreal aspects to just genre thrillers like Lola on Fire. This dude can do no wrong. He, <laughs> When he works with his original content, they... He, I, I don't. I don't know how he does it. That's that's all I'm gonna say. This, this book. This book, that's all I'm gonna say about that. I have no idea how he does it, so I'm gonna move on. Uh, as far as the characters are concerned, we follow. Uh, let's see here. Luke, who is a shamed uh, actor. Everybody thinks he murdered his wife. Uh, Kitty is a skater. Uh, she's awesome. Uh, she also does drug running and things. Or she she she's a dealer on the streets. Uh, uses her skateboard to get around that kind of thing. Then you have Johan. Fly, our wonderful villain, uh, who carries around a an axe that I am not going to try to pronounce um, because I, I'm not. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I wish I would have had the audiobook so I could have looked it up um, because three of the pronunciations on YouTube were all drastically different. So, um, but he is a Viking with an axe, and uh, he is also a social media content creator. Yeah, um, but he is the villain. Uh, he's uh, rich as hell, and he, <sighs> the dude is brutal. Um, there is one scene in here, especially that uh, that that the gore hound in me, the the the, per the little child in me that loves just gore splattered everywhere, absolutely adored. Um, and that's one thing that viewers does fantastically is he blends genres there's uh there's thriller elements there's horror elements there's drama elements and there's even some some light comedy to take you out of that dark place in your head where kittens and rainbows go to die um this book is a lot of fun um i said of lola on fire his last book that that one had rockets for shoes this one has a jetpack it blows right by it's almost 400 pages in hardcover size so six by nine and i just didn't want to ever Ever stop reading. I had to sometimes because I had other obligations to get through. But uh, this one is out on, oh, let's see here. Where's the, usually they put it on the, the oh yeah, February 22nd, so coming up very shortly. Uh, Matthew's book is also out on February 22nd. Uh, I'm pointing back there. It's actually sitting right here. Should have told you that up front. My bad. But all the links and everything will be down there in the doobly-doo. You can go pre-order the book. Um, the There was one, I have one gripe. One small gripe. 
Um, and this has nothing to do really with the, the book because he, he, he made up for not showing it. There is a ritual that uh, one of the characters mentions. Um, now, there's nothing supernatural per se in this book, but uh, there's a ritual that is mentioned um, that I really wanted to see on paper that I did not get to see. Um, if that is a slight spoiler, I apologize, but it... it we, we, we are told what would happen, but we never get to actually see it. Um, that is not to say that there are not many epic fight scenes and kills in this book. Um, the final showdown, I believe, lasts for about 60 pages. I don't know. I didn't really pay attention, but it, it, it blew right by. Once that, once I think the showdown in the Rattlesnake Hotel, which is just awesome. I mean, I'd read a whole book with that title. Uh, once that hit, once that part hit... It was. I, I was in for the rest of the ride. Um, you have uh, s several henchmen, ne'er do wells. Uh, my favorite character in the book does have very little screen time or page time, and dies very early on, and that kind of upset me. But it it also motivated me to you know continue reading because I didn't know who all was was safe and yes it is a it is a minor side character but I really really like this character um, another aspect of the book is you have uh, this drug called canary which is basically meth for rich people it's an expensive form of meth um, gives you energy puts you on your a game so on and so on um, I like that aspect as being a former drug addict myself um, I, I appreciate stories uh, about that. I would have liked to have seen more from, now that I think about it, I've already written my review, but now that I think about it, I would have liked to seen a little more on like the results, the aftermath of the drug, a little more on that. Um, but th th these are all minor gripes. I'm giving this an easy five stars. The dread is fantastic because you don't know who's going to be safe. The pacing is off the charts because I never wanted to put it down. So that is No Second Chances by Rio Ewers out February 22nd. Go and pre-order it, or if you're watching this after it comes out, definitely go and buy it. Next up, we have the first book, and this is where I'm going to explain why I'm doing this. You'll see books are disappearing as we're talking. Uh, behind me are 52 and a little more. Um, there are 52 books I want to read this year. They are all uh, drastically different books, um, books that I've had on my TBR for ages. And I finally decided, after flaking on Brad Proctor's Dracula read-through, I went out and bought the book brought it home, and I went all the way through January and didn't read a single page of it, I decided I'm not doing that anymore. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm not allowed to, to buy a book, and I'm going to stick to this because my, my wife is controlling the money, and I told her not to, and she, she will put her foot down. Um, she will not allow it. The only book I can buy this year is the new Stephen King fairy tale. Did you watch my live on that? You need to go watch that if you haven't. But uh, anyways... Uh, so I put all these books back here so that you guys can watch it like a progress bar dwindle as the year goes by. Um, so I won't be doing individual reviews. I will be doing these long form videos where you get every, you know, every single one of the books that you see behind me. Plus bonus content. If I read, I, I have four books a month for, uh, yeah, I think, I think I did the math right, four books a month to get me all the way through to the end of the year. And the first book I read um, with that in mind is The Infatuations by Javier Marias. And I might have said that wrong. Uh, Max, if you're down there in the doobly-doo, please let me know whether or not I mangled this dude's name. He is a Spanish author. Um, I believe he's from Madrid. Uh, there's uh, This book came highly recommended and I'm not entirely sure why. I think the reason why is because once upon a time, I said I like books that are interesting where nothing happens because I find that impressive. Um, if, if there's nothing going on in the book and you still keep my attention, then I, I'm, I'm there for it. This is not that book. Um, this, this book is a rambling, meandering uh, pile of author intrusion, if I'm going to be fair and honest. Uh, there were some beautiful, beautiful passages that I highlighted um, for future use to, to go back and read. Um, really nails uh, aspects of the human condition. But other than that, this book is just people sitting around having conversations. It is a 300-page Colorado kid. Colorado kid was over long at 100 pages, so you can imagine how bad this one is. Um, the characters consistently repeat themselves. 
um, in conversation, and that's annoying because it is brick after brick, paragraph after paragraph, and I'm talking paragraphs, whole page paragraphs of one-sided conversations. Someone sitting there and just expound, just con- continuously talking and talking and then they'll repeat themselves kind of like I do in these videos they'll repeat themselves repeat themselves oh by the way did I already say that yeah you already said that you said that six times before the the unbelievability factor here is off the charts because people don't talk this way especially not the characters that are shown here um I don't there it's not believable and it feels like the author got stuck in his own mind and wanted to get his own point across the problem is the point of the book which is quite a bit like uh, one no one and one hundred thousand by Luigi Pirandello um is that uh, how we see the world is different from how other people see the world. Uh, there are there are aspects of the book that I didn't agree with whatsoever, like um, murder uh, is shouldn't be a crime because the person affected by the by the murder is no longer here to complain about it. Um, I found that silly. Uh, I don't I don't know if he but he he mentions it a lot in this book. The story follows a woman named Maria. Um, who is rather stalking, if we're going to be honest, stalking a man uh, who shows up where she likes to eat every single day with his wife, and she sits and she watches them very creepily. Uh, And I thought we were going to have more of that, but then the man is murdered in the very first or second chapter, and she gets to befriend the wife. Through the wife, she meets uh, the the dead man's friend, um, his dead man's friend's companion, and the book goes off the rails from that because it's just Maria listening to this man or uh, this woman, the the widow, talk. That's it. And but the the funny part about it is Maria's. Well, the annoying part about it is Maria's internal thought is no different from the man, no different from the widow, no different from anyone else in the book. Every single one of these characters sound exactly the same. That's not good writing. Um, I, and I can't help but think that it's not the translation that is the problem, but it is the author that is the problem. So I'm giving this two stars. And if you were one of the people who who said I definitely needed to read this book, I, I bought this hardcover full price because it came so highly recommended. I want you to defend yourself down there in the doobly-doo. I want to tell me what it, is, what it is about this book that you like so much. I even had one person on Twitter say that this book completely changed their lives and affected their writing style for the better, Um, and I just kind of cringed, and I was like, well, I'm never going to read your books if it's anything like this. Uh, So please, let me know, um, just... Just tell me why that you why you like this as much as you did because I certainly completely missed it and the reason why I'm giving it two stars instead of one because I didn't like any of the uh, pretty much all of the book bored that bored me to tears. What I what, the reason why I'm giving it that extra star is because there are those beautiful passages but they are so few and far between. There's maybe six in this entire 300 page book. And that's just a mess. So yeah, that one is the Infatuations by Javier Marias. Next up, we have another Haruki Mirakami. I gotta get through the rest of this dude's books. Uh, this one, I think, is the seventh or eighth book I've read by him, and that is South of the Border, West of the Sun. Uh, this is a romance on par with uh, Norwegian Wood and After Dark, and this one is what the last book, The Infatuations, should have been. It is people sitting around talking, but Haruki Mirakami makes it interesting. Uh, there is a there, there is something I want to mention, and I mentioned in my Goodreads review. Um, in 2018, Haruki Murakami won a Bad Sex Award in Fiction, a Bad Sex in Fiction Award for his novel 1Q84. Haruki Murakami writes about awkward people having awkward conversations and even and, and equally awkward sex. Uh, I, I'm I'm flummoxed that context is not used when these rewards are given. They're basically Raspberry, uh, the movie, well, the book edition of the Raspberry Awards, but specifically about sex. Yes, the sex is terrible in his books, but we're talking about awkward people having awkward sex. I, I don't understand why context isn't, and if these awkward characters are having awkward sex, they're staying true to their character, and Haruki Mitakami is, is not, it's not bad writing, it's what the characters would be doing, and to me, it's believable. Um, let's have that discussion down there in the doobly-doo if you want to. Um, bad sex 
can be bad and still be good if that is the intention of the author, and I feel it is. Um, also, and this is just my complete, the, the, just my weird thoughts on the author, I, I think from reading Haruki Minakami's book, I believe that this this man is an asexual. He doesn't like sex. If, if, he, if he does, it's... It, I, I, I don't I don't know because he doesn't write it with any flair any passion whatsoever it's just here is some awkwardness and I believe to this day he is single after several divorces and failing you know completely uh, living a reclusive life so on and so forth um, but again I'm, I'm wondering why context isn't used when when, when people read a, a bad sex scene is it supposed to be bad is it supposed to be funny is it supposed to be horrifying is it supposed to be any of these things Usually people just zone in on whether or not they were turned on. Um, and the point is not always to get you to get you dripping or get you rock. It, it, it's not. Anyways, so this one is about uh, a man. I hope I don't murder this. I looked up the hijami. Hijami meets a young girl in high school and he falls in love with her and uh, this girl has a limp. And throughout his life, he sees this girl uh, or women who might be her limping along. He even chases one down and is uh, paid off to not, you know, follow her anymore. <clears throat> there are a lot of surreal aspects to this one, so that's why I'm putting After Dark in there. But it's very Norweg Norwegian wood, um, which is, has no surreal aspects whatsoever. It is a very basic love story drama, that kind of thing. Uh, coming of age, that kind of thing. This one has some coming of age elements early in the book, um, but then there is there is an alluded to twist at the end. He leaves it wide open, and I don't mind that whatsoever because I think there's enough building blocks set up throughout the book, enough of a foundation for me to build the assumption that I came to, which I'm not going to tell you because it would be a huge spoiler. Uh, but I I really enjoyed this one. Other than, and this might sound like hypocrisy to you, and that's fine, but the awkwardness was a little too cringe for me. Um, there were times when I was just like, oh man, it, it's kind of like watching those YouTube fail compilations where it is just, just everyday people being awkward and uh, these horrible shitty creators will bundle all these up together and be like cringe comp compilation, not fail compilation, cringe compilations. And it's just, you know, I, I can't stand stuff like that. Like I can't stand watching pranks, um, especially not either violent or ugly or nasty pranks on people. I can't stand that. And this book, while it didn't have that aspect, no pranks or anything like that, some of the awkwardness of this just grated on my nerves like I was reading, like I was reading, like I was eating or chewing on tin foil. Um, so there were many scenes where I was very uncomfortable. Now, was that the point? Yeah, but also I don't like that feeling. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to take off one star from it because it wasn't enjoyable. Do books always have to be enjoyable? No, but I'm, it's, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. Um, but Again, the whole reason to read this one, I feel, is for the ending, and I would love to hear, if you're going to do this, put spoiler at the top of your comment, I would love to hear what you think about the ending of this book. But yeah, so that is South of the Border, West of the Sun by Haruki Minakami. One more thing, I love how the title plays in to the book. Um, it's described very well, and it also gives you some perspective on when uh, Americans talk about the border, we're talking about the border between uh, uh, Mexico and um, America. W usually we're not talking about Canadian-American border, and we're not talking about any other border. I mean, even Don Winslow released a book called The Border, and everybody knew what he was going to be talking about. Um, and it was interesting seeing these characters that were not American discuss where this border was and how they came to find out what the border was and so on and so forth. I found that interesting. So yeah, we're going to move on to the next book now. Next up, we have Home Going by Ya Giasi. Uh, again, if I've mispronounced this name, I apologize. I looked up pronunciations, but there were several different pronunciations, especially for some characters in the book. Um, like uh, Quay, uh, the, the, it was... Uh, that, 
there were two different because there's one pronunciation that's key um, for the spelling. It's Q U A Y, I believe it was. Um, one pronunciation was key. Another one was Quay, um, so I'm not 100% sure. I, I apologize, but if you'd like to direct me to a pronunciation of it that is accurate, um, I am more than willing to learn because I will be reading more from this author in the future. Uh, this is a saga about um, uh, two families and how they are, what what they experience throughout time, all the way from the. Uh, Let's see here. The 1700s. It's all the way from uh, sl slave, slave period um, in American history. Though the book starts off in Africa um, and moves all the way up to present day, and I love that aspect of it. Each and every chapter is from a different character's point of view. There are huge time jumps. I think some of my my favorites were the uh, initial ones, um, and I, I say I say favorites not because I enjoyed what was going on, but because I, it was it was an it was interesting to read even though it was vile and horrible and of course this stuff did happen um, the the parts in the uh, sub basement or the basement of the castle dungeon you might as well call it I don't think it's ever called a dungeon um, the living conditions that the uh, the slaves were put through down there um, and this was in I think it was the great uh, was it cat? I can't remember the name of it. Something castle, um, where it, this was in Africa, and then the discussion about uh, tribes selling their, you know, the captured peoples of other tribes um, that they had captured to um, Americans, and then the the slave ships, and then slavery in America. It, it goes through the entire timeline. It's uh, much different than Colson Whitehead's uh, Underground Railroad, in as much, and I mention that because that happens over vast period of time, but uh, Whitehead's, while h historically accurate in the sense that those things happened, it was inaccurate as far as the time frame because Whitehead put all of these things like the syphilis testing um, and, and so many different things um, out of order or earlier in time to fit his narrative. In here, it follows the actual timeline of these things happening. Um, the story of the mother and the fire really, really got to me, um, and I was utterly shocked by the ending. Not that it was a twist ending, but what happened at the end, I thought for sure something was going to happen, and that did not happen. Um, and then we wrap it all up at the end, bringing everything full circle, um, and that was just beyond impressive for me. I'm giving Homegoing five stars, mainly for the characters, also for the dread because there were there was just as much hope as there was horror in this book. Some of the chapters end on lighter notes or even extremely hopeful notes, and and other ones just end disastrously. I think my one minor gripe would have been that I wanted a little bit more because of the way each chapter ends. Um, I wanted more from that, and I although you do hear about those characters later on in the narrative. I wanted a little bit more, but I'm still giving it five stars because it's amazing just the way it is. Um, the pacing, I read this one two chapters a night. Um, it's not a book that you're going to blow through. Um, it, it, well, you might. I don't know. Um, I was a big fan of the writing, but still, I measured it out so that I would have time to think every night after I after I got done. I'd have time to just sit back and, and think about the stuff that I read. Um, so character, pacing, dread, all that stuff is off the charts. If you have not read this book, it's been out forever. Um, it's, it's another one I bought because it, it came highly recommended. Uh, luckily, this one... Uh, this one was amazing. Um, so thank you, everybody, who mentioned that I needed to read Homegoing. What is that noise? I don't know. Anyways, um, but uh, th this one gets easy, like I said, easy five stars from me, and that is Homegoing by Ya Jiasi. Next up, um, we have a review of an author that I have been hard on in the past, um, and we are going to clear that up now. Uh, the... I, I don't want to talk about the book that I was hard on. I will talk about the book that uh, I absolutely loved, and that was Double Feature, which made me want to read this one, which is his first his first book, and that is We're All in This Together by Owen King. If you guys have been a fan of the channel for any amount of time, you know what book I'm talking about, so I don't have to talk about it. But uh, We're All in This Together is a novella. Uh, it's the 
titular novella. So the first novella is We Are All In This Together is a fantastic story about a son and his grandfather and uh, a mixture of political beliefs. And it's not preachy. Don't worry. It is very, very funny. And I think that's what I miss the most about the other one, that the, the one we shall not mention. Um, I, I remember reading Double Feature and being amazed at how funny that one was. But there's also a lot of drama. It's also very heartfelt. And this one is no different. Uh, we are all in this together. The, the title novella um, is my probably my favorite piece in here. Uh, not because it's the longest, but because I, I felt it, it gave me a, a, a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment by the end um, that I wasn't expecting. Uh, you go into literary fiction expecting uh, certain things, like uh, thematic elements, um, uh, very heavy character development, so on and so forth. And you have all that here. But it was so funny. Also, there were, I, multiple times I laughed out loud. Uh, now I'm gonna go through the net, the the rest of the stories and talk very briefly about them. There's only one, two, three, four, five. Well, no, there's only s one, two, three, four. There's only five stories, including the novella. In the, <clears throat> sorry, in this, uh, the first short story is someone's driving a, a TV in, in the background. I can't do anything about it because I don't have any other time to shoot this video. So just bear with me. Uh, Frozen Animals is about a dentist um, during the uh, trapper time in American history, I'm guessing. So Old West, what? I, I don't know. I, I'm not read up on that era. But uh, these uh, two guys who live out in the woods take this dentist up to pull this Native American woman's tooth. Native American woman is the, uh, the wife of one of the trappers. And it gets dark, uh, like pitch black dark. But it is also funny. Um, in in cer certain ways, um, especially when I don't know, I probably shouldn't have found the tooth pulling, the teeth pulling as funny as I did, but I was laughing. Um, but it gets pitch black there at the end, and it is a fantastic ending, I thought. Um, as far as the payment for the tooth pulling is concerned, I was like, oh lord. Anyways, uh, next one is Wonders. Um, Wonders is. I mean, it's just so much fun. Uh, it is about a geek show baseball team. So you have one one character who has two heads. It's always constantly sleeping, um, drooling on his shoulder. Uh, you have another character whose head's on backward. So it literally just turned around, like, it's facing that way, man. Um, and uh, other, I don't want to spoil anything else for you if you plan on reading this, but uh, it, it's a great story. The, the best part about it is I hate, I fucking loathe baseball. I can't stand it. My dad always had it on growing up. Uh, same with Westerns. I can't stand either one of those anymore. Um, in fact, I've stayed away from the whole splatter, splatter Western uh, genre, uh, even though I love the covers. I've stayed away from it because I just can't get into it. And I've only written one Western in all my days, and that was a 12,000 uh, word novelette. So yeah, I really don't like the uh, the genre at all. Now, uh, th th but th this was fun because I was watching geeks play baseball. Um, and there's, there's some hilarious stuff in here, but there's also a bit of social commentary that I enjoyed. Um, Owen works really, really well with, with characters and in a literary sense, um, where all of his characters are well thought out and deep. Um, and that's just something that was missing from the one that shall, but shall not be named, at least, uh, in my opinion. So, uh, in Snake, uh, Snake is my second favorite story in the collection. Snake is about a young boy whose relationship with his father is not great. Uh, he feels unloved. Uh, the father's inat inattentive. Uh, the boy goes to the mall one day and he meets a snake handler uh, who might be kind of scammy, scam artisty, um, but it is also a testament to the power of story. Um, that stories don't have to be true to have impact. Uh, story, you know, fiction um, is so sometimes more important than fact. Um, in fact, in my eyes, it, it's always more important than fact because um, fiction does, fiction has to make sense and fact doesn't. You know, the world is a chaotic place. It's nothing but chaos. And in fiction, you usually find some kind of answers. And I find a bit of, uh, I don't know, there's something about that that, that makes me happy. Even if, it, even if it's bad, 
Um, even if they, it's a, uh, a horrible, not a horrible ending, but even if it's a, uh, depressing ending, I still like that, you know, fiction tends to follow the rules in that aspect to where we get enough to explain. And I think bad fiction doesn't give us enough. Um, but Owen definitely in, in double feature in this one definitely gives us enough to care about the characters and care about what's going on and makes it believable enough to keep your attention. Um, and I respect that. Uh, next up is my uh, second wife. Um, this one, even though I'm giving this collection uh, five stars, complete five stars, this one is probably my least favorite in the collection. Not that I didn't like it. It's like this story is four stars while all the rest of them are five stars. And with this one, I, I got the title. I mean, I get where everything w was going, but also looking back on it, I don't remember too much about this one. Um, and I read this one alone by itself. I read the other three back to back to back. I read this one alone and by itself. And I, I don't know, there's something something about this one and I can't put my finger on it. Um, this is the worst type of reviews for me because I, I can't articulate exactly what didn't work for me. All I know is that subconsciously, there was something that bothered me, um, that didn't bother me about the rest of the stories. Um, and choosing to end with that story, I was also a bit confused. And not that it was, again, not that it was bad. I liked it, but maybe it felt a little too much like the voice of the character in the first novella. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. And I don't want to end this one on a bad note. So I'm going to harp on the fact that the first four out of the five stories were absolutely amazing and this one was still good. Um, as far as the plot is concerned, well, the, there's not a whole lot of plot in literary fiction to begin with, but I can't truly, I know he ends up with another, with another person and that's where the second wife comes into play. Uh, but yeah, I'm pretty much blanking on all of it and that tends not to be a good thing, but um, I did enjoy it while I was reading it, but I can't remember it. Am I going to be able to remember it tomorrow? Maybe. I don't know. I am. I do have short-term memory issues, so and that's another reason why I repeat myself in these videos. So y'all calm down. You're picking on me anyways. But yeah, so we're all in this together by Owen King. I'm giving this one a five star and I highly recommend that you read this one and, and double feature and ignore or the other one. <laughs> but anyways, uh, now we are going to move on to the bonus round. Okay, so for the bonus round, I read Nothing But Blackened Teeth by Cassandra Kaw. And holy shit, is this book amazing. I have read numerous reviews. In fact, right now, as of right now, as of me writing my Goodreads review, it has a average rating of 2.83 on Goodreads. So we are going to talk very little about this book, and we are going to talk a whole lot about this community. Um, the first thing I want to say is the book is beautifully brutal and exquisitely written. It is fantastic. The 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 language, the 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 prose snaps, it crackles, it pops. It's it's got punch. Every single line has punch. The characters, you're not going to like these people or root for them, but they, uh, they do react consistently and believably in the situations that they are put into. That is literally all I, oh, and then the ending is brilliant. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now, I'm going to talk to the members of the community um, who have reviewed this book, because I have some issues. Um, there's several reviews that say that this book has too many big words. I guess I should have seen it coming. Um, with a TLDR crowd, um, but readers complaining about big words, and I don't even know what the hell they're talking about here, um, it's, but it seems to be a trend with these reviews, um, talking about how uh, meandering and flowery the language is, how purple the prose is, how verbose the prose is. Um, it's funny that people who are complaining about cause word choice, word usage are using words like uh, maudlin and verbose. That tickles me. Um, so. Uh, another thing is a lot of reviewers don't seem to understand the difference between character and narrative voice. Um, I saw several characters like the uh, the descriptions and everything would be beautiful and then the uh, the characters would talk and they would sound like idiots. 
Oh, that's because the characters didn't write the book. Narrative voice and character voice are two completely different things. They can blend like in a first person narrative, but they are two completely different things. When you have this group of characters that talk in a certain way that is believable and consistent to those characters, those characters can sound like idiots. They can be idiots and the writing in the narrative can still be beautiful. It makes sense if you pay attention to the book. I can't believe y'all are readers. I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to catch flack for this, but I'm just going to be 100% honest with you. The book is not badly written. It is not poorly written. She doesn't, they, she, I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this for just, just a second. They're on Goodreads. People were calling a ka they, so they, them pronouns, but in their bio or her bio, it says her. So I'm not sure which one I should use. So my apologies in advance. Um, I'm going to stick with her because that's what's in the bio. And I haven't actually heard her or read anything about her uh, preferring they, them. So we're going to stick with that for now. Now, uh, and that could be a publisher thing because it is the, I believe it's the bio from uh, the back of the books as well. So Anyways, um, but my apologies, if it is they, them, then I will start using that from, from now on. Um, but I, I don't have any proof, and the only thing that I have for certain from her end is her. Um, there are also personal attacks going on in the community because of uh, what, whatever it might be. Um, I, I don't want to get too far into that, but uh, there are personal attacks regarding the author uh, herself, and that's bothersome and upsetting, and not just from from the people that you would suspect. Um, they, these are these are people that even I follow because these popped up in my friends on Goodreads reviews, and I'm sitting back. I'm I'm wondering. Yeah, I'm wondering why I'm associating with these people whatsoever. Um, but the the thing that, that that gets me is the the complaining about concise, even poetic language. This is not Alan Moore's Jerusalem. This is not a 1,200-page book about every single little detail. That is verbose. That is me meandering. And that is loaded with purple prose or mo maudlin writing, whatever you want to call it. That is, a, that is what you guys are, are talking about. This book is not that. This book is very concise. It chooses a specific word that fits perfectly in the sentence to describe whether it be a verb or whatever, whatever it may be to perfectly, it, it's deceptively simple, which it, it's kind of like Jack Ketchum in that it is, it is or, or Cormac McCarthy is even better, although those two authors have nothing to do with Ka. It doesn't read, they don't read anything like she does. But with, with this, it's, I don't understand it. I, I'm, and the only thing that I can think of is that this is the TikTok crowd, this is the TLDR crowd, that just doesn't like challenging themselves. If they have to open up a dictionary or a thesaurus, not a thesaurus, a dictionary or look it up on dictionary.com or whatever to figure out a word, it, it breaks something in them. I don't, I don't understand it. That, I guess it's, I'm getting old. I'm 41 years old and that's how I was taught how to read. Um, if you don't, if you don't know a word, go look it up. And in this book, if any of the words that I've seen, and there's very few examples, which is another thing that sets off all the red flags and alerts, there are very few examples of exactly what these reviewers are saying is maudlin, purple, or verbose. Very few examples. Also, the book is 128 pages. It's 128 pages. That's verbose. No, there's way too much going on in this book for it to be, it, it'd be like, you know, the, the not the silence, but what is it? Uh, the Body Artist by Don DeLillo is a verbose hundred page book because nothing happens in it. This book has plot. This book has stuff going on. It has some of the gnarliest horror, especially body horror I have ever read. And I really do wish that you, you'd pull, you'd pull your head out of your asses. Now, all that being said, you probably clicked away already if you're mad, but all that being said, if the book did not work for you, that's one thing. If you just didn't like it, that's fine. But to call the book badly written and to call the book poorly written says far more about the, the reader 
than it does the author. But that's it for this month. Once again, I read seven books um, and a total of 1,944 words. If you have anything you want to discuss about this book down there in the doobly-doo, please leave all the comments you want to. But until next time, I have been E, you have been you. This has been the first long-form uh, video uh, detailing what I read in January. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye-bye.